Third try. <laughs> Good afternoon. <laughs> uh, so um, when, when you have waves being emitted by different sources, sometimes you, you observe that these uh, waves interfere with each other. Sometimes you don't. If we think of light sources, uh, for example, you have two uh, torches, two lanterns, and I point, or, or the light from these two bulbs, if I turn one off, I see some light. If I turn the other one off, I see the light. And when I put them together, I just see twice as much light. They're not, they don't seem to be talking to each other. They don't seem to be causing interference. Well, if I do the same thing with a laser, I break it into two parts, and then I join it, I will see these interference fringes. So what is happening there? Uh, it's all about uh, statistics. And, and this concept of coherence is, is some averaging that happens. And um, there's an expression in English that says, beauty is in the eye of the beholder. That is, beauty is in your eyes, not in the thing that you're looking. Coherence is also like that. Coherence is in the eye of the beholder. What is, depending on what your integration time is or when, what type of detector you have, something can be coherent or incoherent or something in between. It's not something intrinsic of the field, it's some combination of the field and how you measure it. So this degree, what coherence is, is, uh, is about is if you have some source uh, emitting some complicated field, um, the coherence is a property between what the field is doing at one point, let's say, and at another point, or at one time, at another time. And essentially, it's a measure of how much correlation there is between what's happening here and what's happening here. How much, uh, how much can you make those two things? Uh, have, uh, if you know the field here, how much can you tell me about what's going on here? And I like making this analogy. Suppose that these are water waves. So we're somewhere in the sea. It's nighttime, so you, don't, you cannot see. And you're in your little boat. You work for... for uh, for the Italian Coast Guard, and you're in charge of being somewhere and measuring the waves. So, so you're in your boat, and then you feel like your boat is going up and down, up and down. And then um, you have your, your, your friends in another boat here, uh, just a few meters away. And, and then you know that when you're going up with the wave, chances are your friend is also going up. And, and then when you're going down, you're going down. So you have a large correlation. You cannot see your friend because it's nighttime, but you can call him on the phone and say, oh, yeah, I'm up. Yes, me too. I'm down. Me too. So there's perfect correlation. Or your friend could be, let's say, here. And, uh, and then you say, I'm up. And your friend says, I'm down. I'm, I'm down. No, I am up. Do you have correlation there or not? Yes, just as good. It's anti-correlation. It's, it's, it has a negative sign, but there is correlation. Or if you, even if you're a quarter of a wave, so I'm up, well, I'm on my way up, and uh, etc. So, so as long as you can predict what's happening, then, then that's fine. Now, if, if then uh, your friends start their boat, and they start moving, not 10 meters away, but uh, 100 meters, uh, 1,000 meters, very far, at some point, you start losing that correlation because the, the water waves are so complicated that uh, over time, when you average over time, there is no much predictability of what's happening in one place from what's happening at the other place. So that's what we call, roughly speaking, coherence. How much power of correlation you have between two points. And when, when it is in the direction of the propagation of waves, the separation is what we call longitudinal coherence, when it is in this direction, is transverse coherence. And you can already see that there this concept of coherence length and coherence width, which is if I, over time, uh, we're on the phone and we correlate our, our, what we feel. Uh, uh, so when, when he's very, uh, very close, of course, we have for this distance, if I use myself as the origin, we have a lot of correlation. But as he keeps going away, it's less, 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 less. And at some point, uh, if I'm here and my friend is near Japan, then there's no correlation. So, um, so we can define some coherence length as some distance where this drops to some 
halfway level or something like that. Similarly, with the coherence width in this direction, if I use myself as the, as the, as the reference, you can keep moving here, and you see that there's some, some separation over which we have uh, some, some uh, uh, given correlation. So that is basically the idea behind this uh, coherence, uh, theory of coherence. So when we have a source that is very, very monochromatic, very, very uh, deterministic, then there's predictability over long, long distances. But if not, uh, it takes a, uh, it, then it is more limited. Um, the same with time. I could have done the same thing here with, say, uh, so I'm sitting here on my boat, and I'm taking records. I'm up at this time, and down at this time, I'm up at this time. And then I make a prediction. OK, in 10 hours, am I going to be up or down, or in five hours, etc. And, and again, your predictions are going to be pretty good for some time, and then they're going to start, you're going to be losing that, and then you cannot predict uh, beyond a certain time. So that would be temporal coherence, how much correlation is between different times. OK, so where does coherence come from? Um, this is a very simple cartoon of how, uh, for example, a thermal light source would work. So if I have some object, and each atom or molecule is emitting, oh, well, we know that these have levels, and we can excite it, and then it decays. And when it decays, it emits light. Uh, I'm using a classical picture here, so I don't want to call this a photon, because I, I don't want to get into what a photon means. It's just some pulse of light. And it has a given duration. Um, and, and each one of these particles is going to be emitting like this several times. And in addition, there are many of them, each one emitting. They emit more or less at random times. So if I see this one is emitting then, and then for a while doesn't do anything, then it emits again, emits again, then emits again at some other random time. Same with the other atom or molecules, same with the other. And when I add them all up at, at some detector, I get some signal like this. So what can you tell me about the coherence time of this source? Over what separation of times do I have some predictability? The coherence, length, uh, the coherence time, uh, this is the time axis. So the coherence time, which is related to the length of the individual pulses. Think of an analog of uh, picture. Say you have a road, and you have a car here, a red car here, uh, a white car, sorry. Then I have a red car, green then I have a blue car, and I have a brown car, etc. And and then I, I I I cannot see the whole photo. I just see this lines here. So over how much distance can I predict what I'm going to see if I look at another slice of this? Only over the length of half the length of a car. If I move by half a car's distance then I can predict what cars I'm going to see. If I come here, I have no clue, because all these cars have ended. <laughs> so, so where are the new cars, what color they're going to be, etc. I just don't know. It's the same thing here. I, I have some power of predictability. If I know the field here, more or less for some time around this, equivalent to the width of each one of these pulses. Because if I go far away, the pulses that are given rise to this field here are completely different than those ones given rise to the field here. Therefore, I have no predictability. I just don't know if the phase is going to be up or it's going to be down. So this is what causes the, the, it's a way of understanding what causes this temporal coherence. The fact that there's a randomness in when these things are emitted, even if they were identical, they're emitted at random times, and therefore I can only tell you what the, the waves, I can only predict what the waves are going to do for, for some length of time equivalent or related to the, the, the length of each one of these pulses. 
that idea make sense? Yeah. How can we measure that? Well, there's this classic uh, experiment where I can, uh, with the Michelson interferometer, so I send my light source, and I have a half mirror here. So half of the light goes this way, bounces back here, half goes this way, bounces ba back here. So I can interfere the light with itself, causing a delay by moving one of the mirrors. So I can, by moving the mirrors, I can, I can cause a delay. And if the difference in path is very small, then I, I can see interference. So, so when it's very, very small, they're in phase, they're constructive interferingly, each one of those pulses, and I get uh, a lot more light. But then I move it a bit by half a cycle, and then they cancel mostly. Then it's constructive again, etc. cetera. But then it start, I start losing this as soon as I make the separation uh, bigger, because the amount of light that comes from the same pulses that are inhabiting at the same time uh, in this detector is, uh, is smaller. And once my separation is longer than the typical length of a pulse, there's no, there's no correlation. So this is a way to understand this concept of temporal coherence. Uh, uh, it's the, the time difference over which I can get interference that is robust in time. Let me stress that if this were an instantaneous detector that just at one time measured the, the, the light, I always have the superposition of a field with another field, and that would give me some crazy fringes. But because this is, has a detection time much longer than these wiggles of the fields, some, at some times, these things are going to interfere constructively, and some other ones, they're going to destructively, and they're going to average out. And I'm going to get that this averages to something pretty boring. Uh, well, for these small separations, it's always in phase or always out of phase, and I get this, this, uh, this uh, persistent uh, fringes. Okay. That makes some sense? Let me then, I'm going fast. Uh, okay, I'm going to skip that math. Well, let me just um, show you quickly what this is. So, so how would I define the field in the detector? I would have the field that went through one of those paths, and then the field went through the other path. And, and this is delayed a little bit because it went a longer path. And what we measure, as Anna has told us several times, is the intensity, the modulus squared of the field. So I have to take the modulus squared, which is this times this complex conjugate. And because it's something plus something times something plus something, we expand it as the square of the first, the square of the second, and then the cross term. And then we, these, average, these brackets here means we have to average in time because our detector is slow, is integrating in time. So this is just the light coming from one path. And if I average it in time, it's fairly constant. It's like the light from this light bulb. If you were to plot what the electric field at each point is doing at a very fast scale, it's doing a crazy oscillation. But if I look at it, it looks pretty boring to me. It looks constant because the average is constant. My, my eye is not fast enough to, to see all these, all these oscillations. So it looks constant, and this would be constant again. Same with this. This is just delayed a little bit of time. But this cross term is what gives us the, what we call the correlation. So the correlation is the average in time of the field with a delay with the field with no delay. Not so important for this uh, course, but what I show here is something called the wiener hingin uh, theorem, which tells me that this correlation between what the field is doing at one time and what it does at another time, if I take the Fourier transform of that, I get the spectrum of the source. So the, the Fourier transform of the spectrum of the source is not the signal in time, it's the correlation. So uh, a source that is like a laser that has a spectrum that is very sharp, 
has what type of uh, spectrum? Uh, what type of correlation? So if the spectrum is very sharp, like this, so, so this is as a function of frequency, this is the spectrum, so it only, it's only emitting at a very fixed frequency, then the Fourier transform of something very sharp is something very wide. Yeah, so that's a very coherent field. The, 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 the correlation goes for a long time. While uh, some source like this one has a much wider spectrum, so it's correlated over much shorter times. Okay. How does a laser work? Well, it's very similar, but uh, these little trains are, uh, each one, when it goes by, it triggers another one. So the second one, let's say, is not, is not emitted at random. It's emitted in coordination with the first one, so they're in phase. And then this one might emit another one, etc. And when you put them together, it gives this uh, something that has some correlation that is much longer than, than the, pol uh, the, the, the duration of each pulse. Using my, my analogy with cars, here I have a train track, <laughs> and I have a train. So each car of the train is not unrelated to the others. They all look the same, and they're all fixed in the same distances. So if I can see where the car of the train is here, I can predict for a long distance what they do. So cars are like pulses that are each one at its own pace, while this one is they're tight. They're, they're, they're linked together. OK. So that's uh, temporal coherence. Let's talk about spatial coherence, which is uh, more, more interesting. Suppose that I have some source here. Source that is, let's say, made out of many particles that are emitting incoherently. So I have some waves like this. And suppose that I want to measure how correlated the field is uh, w for a given distance d, how much correlation there is if I am at a distance capital D from the source. And I find that uh, there's some correlation. Say I choose this to be the point where the correlation drops to about half. Or say I can separate this more and more, and I can measure the coherence width. Now I come further away, and I repeat my experiment. What do you think? As you propagate away from the source, does the, the coherence width get la longer, uh, larger or smaller? Do we gain spatial coherence or do we lose spatial coherence? So who says lose? OK, so that that's, sounds very intuitive. So that you would disorder usually wins, and you get more disorder as you propagate. So you would think, the further away I go, the more, the, the more disorganized and the more separated I would have to make my, uh, sorry, the, the less correlated this would be with this as opposed to this. I'm sorry to tell you that is the other way around. And that's what's called the Van Sittert Cernicke. There's a mathematical description of this, but I want to give you more the physical intuition. And I'm going to show you something that is perhaps the shortest and most unusual and weirdest publication I've ever had the luck to be involved with. called Spatial Coherence from Docs. And this was published in, in Physics, in, what is it, Physics Today. So, so my co-authors are Wayne Knox, who used to be the director of my center, and Emil Wolf, who, who wrote some famous books about coherence. Uh, 
And the story behind this very short, that's the article, by the way. That's it and that. And those are the figures, the docs. The story behind this is Wayne lives, or well, he moved recently, but he used to live in a house in the country. And he had this nice pond next to his house where he kept his ducks. And one morning, it was very quiet, so he couldn't resist bringing his uh, camera and, and filming when he goes and, and frees his ducks. So, so this has sounds and everything. So there's, it's early morning, it's very quiet. The, look at the surface of the water. Okay, this is, takes a while, so let me move forward. So that's where the ducks are. So he's walking there. There, here are the birds. Soon the ducks are going to realize he's coming up to the house. They're going to get very excited. About now. And he lets them out. And there they go directly to the water. Now, let me freeze this here. This, I mean, there are many other effects here that are not described this year, but, but just like uh, at the very simplistic level, each dock now is an independent source. Each one's kicking at its own rhythm, is not worried about what the neighbors are doing, and it's emitting waves. Near the docks, I, I'm getting waves in many directions at random things, and there's a lot of the sort. Look at the water here. Uh, if I let it go over time, if I'm here, I don't know what the water here is going to do. There's a lot of disorder because of, of, of this randomness of the docks. Wrong computer. Um, if I let time go, and then after a while, I go and look at the edge of the, of the pond, have this beautiful long wavefront. That means that I can predict very well what the waves are doing somewhere else compared to where I am. And this is nothing but simple geometry. Here are my docks, and I'm going to show you some simulations in a minute. Each one is emitting more or less a, a, a circular wave. At points like this, the way from this one and the way from this one and the way from this one are coming from very different directions. So in time, the, the evolution in time is going to be very different from this contribution than this contribution than this other contribution. And if I move a little bit, all the, the relative phases between them are going to change very, 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 very uh, drastically. So I just need to move a little bit, and the, the relative directions, all the waves are very different. If I come over here, keep going, this is the wave from one dock, this is the wave from, from another dock, this is the wave from, from another dock. They're extremely similar. They, they are doing pretty much the same and interfering in phase for a long, long distance. So if I draw, this is, so this is the wave from, from one dock, let me use color. This is from another dock. It would take a long distance laterally to have the contribution from one dock and the contribution from the other dock go out of phase with each other. It would take a long distance laterally. Well, here, I just move a little bit, and that's it. So the field I feel here and the field I feel here is very, very similar. And that explains this band theory of theorem, is that all that matters for coherence width is essentially the solid angle or the angle in this case, subtended by the source. Because that tells you the range of directions in which you're getting waves. If you're very close, this is a big angle that the source is subtending. But if you're far away, everything looks like a point source if you go sufficiently far away. And if it's a point source, it's sending you something that is essentially a plane wave, which is very organized. So that's why there's, there appears to be more order as you move far away. 
there's not, it's not that you're getting more order, it's that the disorder is spreading over bigger circles. And therefore, uh, if you just look at a given region, you just see something that is fairly ordered. That makes sense? Okay. Do you want to know the end of the docs? The sad part of the story? <laughs> the docs are dead. I'm sorry. <laughs> so they were eaten by foxes, by eagles, apparently. And the scary, this is Wayne that tells me this. I don't believe him very much, but uh, he claims that there are turtles, big turtles in that, that come, grab them, and, uh, and eat them. So, so there are no ducks anymore. But, uh, but they contributed to science. <laughs> okay. By the way, this video is on YouTube, if you want to <laughs> see it. I think the link is here. All right. Very good. So let me show you how that works. So um, I have three movies here. Suppose that I am an excellent dog trainer. And I told my dogs, you stand there, you stand there, you stand there, you stand there, you stand there. And then I tell them, one, two, three. And I start directing them. And they all kick at the same time. This would create uh, a wave that, let me play this as a movie. This would create a very coherent wave, because there's no disorder. And not only is it very coherent, it is very directional. So the more order there is in the source, the more directionality you can achieve. This is like a plane wave. So this is what a laser is doing, essentially. Instead of dots, they're, they're molecules that are also being synchronized by themselves. So it's not me telling them. It's each one is feeling the waves from the other one and, and responding, saying, oh, I like that rhythm, and going the same way. And, and, and then it would emit this thing. So, so this would be like a laser source uh, that would send a very directional wave. If I'm a even better dog trainer, I could do the following. I can tell my dogs, stand in line, kick at the same rhythm, but you kick very little, you kick a bit more, a bit more, a bit more, and then I do this apodization that we were saying. So I tell the dogs, just do your, your like kick at a, a different strength, each one of them, and this would create something very similar to this Gaussian beam. This would really create a very, very coherent uh, wave. And that's how, yeah, again, how a laser would work. But uh, dogs are not like that. And a situation more similar. OK, Mathematica is freaking out. OK, let me stop this, stop. So this is more like what happens with the real dogs. Uh, they're at random locations, and I'm having them kick at slightly different rhythms, each one of them, slightly different frequencies. And what we see is that there's some nodal lines where there's not much waves. But it goes in all directions, and those nodal lines actually move around as time goes by. So if I were to, to integrate in over a long time that intensity, it would be like this light bulb. It's going everywhere. So to have directionality, you need some measure of order of the waves. Uh, if not, your source is going to emit uh, in all directions. And that's the difference between a thermal wave, a, a thermal source, and a laser, for example. Okay. 
Okay. Very good. Okay. How would I measure uh, spatial coherence? So the, the, there are many techniques, uh, but the, the classical one is if I have my source and I have some, some wave, to measure how correlated the field is here to here, what I do is I put a, a plate here, and I just put two pinholes at those positions. Now this light is going to hit here, and it's going to emit a wave like this, and this one's going to emit a wave like this, and then I can measure uh, that light. And then I put a detector on this plane. If I cover one of the holes, I just get light from this one, I would get something fairly uniformly illuminated. If I cover the other one, I would have something fairly uniformly illuminated. But if I open the two, I could or could not get interference. Why, why wouldn't I get interference? Yes? It's, it's more than the coherence width, yeah. Uh, and ag again, if I were able to take a snapshot, an ultra-fast snapshot of what light is doing at a given instant, I would get some interference, some, some, some high resolution. But if I did it the next instant, it would be something completely different. If I did it the next instant, it would be something completely different. And when I integrate it, it would average out to something boring. However, if these points, the field at these points is very correlated, whatever I get here at a given time is very similar to what I get at another time and what I get another time, and it would persist and it would give me a persistent pattern uh, like this. So it is about, you need integration in time. That's why I say in, uh, coherence is in the eye of the beholder. You need to specify what your integration time is. For example, we did some experiments uh, with some students where we needed to prove something worked when you had some incoherent superposition of two things. And to change from one to the other, we had to change the orientation of a wavelength. And well, uh, if our integration time was in the order of minutes, we could change it by hand, back and forth, let's say. And that's to the detector, that was incoherent because the integration time was much bigger than that. So it doesn't have to be in a nanoscale. The, so the, there are sort of uh, several uh, length scales, one is uh, time scales. One is the, the time scale of the oscillations of the field, and the other one is the time scale of the detector. And uh, those two very often are many, many, many orders of magnitude of difference. And there, there might be. Uh, the time scale of what's of, of the fluctuations of the field. Okay. So let let, let me illustrate this uh, also with some simulations here. So this is a very cartoony version of uh, the No, this is, uh, let me do the previous one. So this is a cartoon version of what happens with a young pink hole experiment. I have a point source here, I have two pink holes, I have a plate with two pink holes, and this is the interference that I would see with a point source, monochromatic point source. So I can move my source to the sides, and I can see that the maxima and minima would move because the line going through the center of the two pink holes has to go to the maximum. Because the, this path and this path uh, have the same length, and then we have constructive interference. I can um, also uh, I can change the separation between the pinholes. I can bring the plate a bit closer to the to the to the source. And but if I separate the pinholes, notice that the closer they are, the more space the 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 the, the, the fringes are. What we call the coherence has to do with the visibility of these fringes. So I have a maximum intensity and a mi minimum intensity. So this degree of coherence, which we call the modulus of gamma, is the intensity maximum minus the intensity minimum divided by the sum.
So for this source, it is completely coherent. Why? Because I minimum is equal to what? Zero. We're getting all the way to zero, so this goes away and this gives me one. If I minimum is equal to I maximum, that is if we have a flat pattern, then the coherence between those two points is zero. Suppose now that I have two sources. Uh, let me bring this a bit closer and separate my pinholes a bit more. So what I'm showing here is I have two sources. Uh, at the moment, they're one on top of each other, but now I'm going to separate them. So I have the green one and the red one. And it, it's not that they're different colors. It's just so you can distinguish them. And they're mutually uncorrelated. So each one is going at its own, at, at its own pace. So one has its maxima and minima completely going from zero to a maximum quantity. But as I shift the relative positions of one against the other, the maxima and minima uh, overlap, or they don't overlap. And because when I integrate over time, the cross terms cancel, what I get is the sum of the intensity of each one of them. So depending on the separation of the holes, I can have something that where the maximum of one cancels the minima of the other, and I have no coherence, no correlation. While for smaller or, big in, or bigger uh, separations, I do have some correlation. So cor the correlation can, is not necessarily a monotonically decreasing uh, function. So I can have full correlation for two points here, and I separate them. Correlation drops to zero, and then it goes it, it, it builds up again. It's actually an anti-correlation, and then it drops again and all that. Turns out that if I measure the coherence as a function of separation like this, that is a Fourier transform of the shape of the source. So they have a connection with the shape of the source. Uh, a continuous version of that uh, is, uh, let me skip this one. I'll go to the next one. It's the same. So now suppose that I have a continuous source. So I bring this closer. And it's not just one point. I have a, an extended source. Each point here is emitting its own light independently and creating its own fringes. But then I add those fringes in intensity because they're, they're, they're incoherent with each other. They, they don't have a temporal correlation. I can see that as I, I, as I open this, there's a lot of visibility uh, for small separations. Then it drops, drops to zero. Then I get a bit of correlation again, but not completely. The visibility here is about how much would you say? It's this minus this divided by this plus this. I don't know. It's, uh, it's like uh, about one. One third or something like that. And then if I keep making the separation bigger, uh, it, it gains again and again and again, and it oscillates. Why? Because, yes? The separation. How can it be not? monotonically decreasing. Um, it turns out that you can have, uh, so if each point in the source, let me erase here. So I have here. So each point here goes both ways and then interferes again here and creates some, some pattern like this. But then I have another point that it does it again, etc. There might be some combination of points here that for some separation give us a, a superposition of these intensity patterns where it just happens that you fill the holes. You, 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 the maxima and minima sort of disappear. But as soon as you open your pinholes, Each one of these fringes are going to shrink. They're going to be more tightly, they're going to oscillate faster. And that condition that guaranteed somehow that, that, you, um, 
that the maximum and minima cancel is no longer satisfied. Let me go back to the case of two sources. Maybe that's easiest to see there. So here it is. So I have two sources uh, at a given separation. So see, initially, sorry, initially uh, when this is, let me bring the separation a bit closer. When, when the, the two pinholes here and here are very, very near, the fringes green and, and, and red from the two point sources are very similar. So their sum is very similar to each one of them. As I make this different, each, each of those fringes is getting more, more uh, faster. And at some point it's so fast, let me, if, uh, if I made this a bit bigger, sorry, so fast that as they shrink, you hit the point where the minimum of one matches the maximum of the other one. And then I lose the coherence. But if I keep going, they get smaller again, and they no longer coincide. For a continuous source, source, something like that happens, it's just a bit harder to see. But you're not guaranteed that, uh, the, that once coherence goes to zero, if you keep separating your points, your coherence is gonna stay zero. It, it, usually, it oscillates. So this, uh, have you heard, how, who of you have heard of the Michelson Stellar Interferometer? Okay, so, so let me show you this example and then I'll explain it with this. So, so if I have a source here of some size and then I fix my pinholes and I move the separation, as I said, the, 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 the correlation as, I, 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 as a function of the pinholes it starts from one, then it goes and it's completely gone, then it goes negative and it's not so big, then it's completely gone, then it's positive and a bit smaller, etc. If I were to plot that correlation as a function of separation, it would give me, starts like this and then goes like this and like this and like this and like this. What is this function? A sink is the Fourier transform of a rect, which is the shape of my source. Uh, there are cases in nature where the source is so small that we cannot form an image of it. But we can use the equivalent of a two pinhole experiment to calculate the correlation as a function of separation and, uh, and calculate this curve. Then we can do a Fourier transform and find the shape and size of the source. And that's what Michelson did in Mount Wilson in California, and uh, forget the years, uh, with a telescope that had a big, like had mirrors like this. Uh, so there was light that came here and then like this, and then same thing here. And he, he could make this then a lens and form fringes here. And he could control the separation of this. It went all the way to about 10 meters. And he could see how visible the fringes were here. And with that, he measured the radial size of the star called, called Betelgeuse, which is so far and so small in the sky that you cannot form an image to measure its size. But by doing this interferometry and getting this as a function the coherence as a function of separation, he could recover this curve and fitting it to what he knew had to be the correlation for, for a disk, because the star's gonna look like a disk. What function would it be for a disk? What is the Fourier transform of a disk? Bessel one divided by its argument. This is our old friend, the, the jink, the, the, the airy pattern. So by fitting it to an airy pattern, he could measure very precisely the radius of, of the star. So you can use coherence as an, an indirect way of uh, measuring that. There's an analogous thing in time with coherence time. Sometimes you can measure with a Michelson, not stellar interferometer, with a, the other Michelson interferometer, with a, the one that divides things into two paths, the temporal coherence uh, as a function of separation. And if you fully transform that, you get the spectrum. So 
In some spectral regions, that's a better way to do spectroscopy than trying to use uh, gray things or anything else. It's more precise, especially in the infrared, I think, is what people use. So you can measure coherence easier than you can measure the spectrum directly. So it gives you a nice indirect way of measuring uh, the spectrum in the temporal uh, uh, case or this tiny little star in the, in the, in the spatial case. Yes. Yes. Which one? <coughs> this one? Uh, well, uh, are you asking, is this, does this really correspond to what I would get if I did everything? Or did I just use a formula? I just used a formula. Because otherwise it would be very slow. And it would look exactly the same. Yes. So I calculated it and then I put it in. Yes. Uh, but you could do it. And, and you can see that it's a Fourier transform because it's a superposition of different waves. Uh, and then it gives you something like a Fourier transform. Yes? The, no, th these are just simple light waves, solutions of Maxwell's equations. They're analogs for Schrodinger equation, but this, this is just good old Maxwell. It's uh, classical waves. Uh, decoherence in the quantum sense. Uh, uh, yes, uh, I'll have to think about that because yeah, I w this is this is a fully classical picture. Yeah. So here, coherence is co is relates to uh, just temporal correlation of random events giving rise to this field. But the, yeah, the, you read the same mathematics apply to to quantum decoherence and things like that. Okay. So, does that concept make sense? So, uh, coherence then, it um, has to do with the ability to, uh, of waves to interfere with each other or not. And let me stress again, they always interfere with each other. It's just whether that interference is persistent in time, self-consistent in time enough that when you do a time average, you see a significant signal or you see an average that is, is now gone. Okay, so how does this relate to uh, microscopy? So I'm going to draw the same drawing that I've drawn every time. Have some sample here. Then typical system. I have some sort of lens or lens system that does a Fourier transform, takes me to a pupil. Then another lens and, and here. So there are two types. So this is our detector. We always talk about these two types of, of uh, imaging. And they are the extremes. Uh, some contexts, we use the intermediate one. Uh, but for microscopy, you, we usually talk about coherent imaging or incoherent imaging. When do we have coherent imaging? Yeah, so we have some sample that is uh, transparent or semi-transparent something, and we illuminate it with a laser source. So each point here is going to diffract the light in some way and all that, and we form an image, but it's so organized that their effects here are persistent in time. On the other hand, 
if we illuminate this with white light or with a, an LED or something, or even if we illuminate it at, with a laser, but what we're observing is not the laser itself, but say the fluorescence, which is a more random emission, then that's incoherent. That, that means that each point is, is like a dock. Each one is gonna emit its own, its own wave that over time, over the time of integration of the detector, is not going to interfere with, uh, with that of the others. And, and how we model those systems is, is very different. If this were coherent, how would we model the, 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 the image? Suppose that there are no aberrations. Let's start with the case of no aberrations. So to go from here to here, with roughly what, what type of mathematical description? A Fourier transform, because it's, this is the focal distance here. So we roughly do a Fourier transform. So if I have a, uh, I have a Fourier transform here, then here I have to go through the pupil. Let me call that multiplication by some function p. And then from here to here, another Fourier transform or an inverse Fourier transform if I invert my axis so that it looks like an inverse Fourier transform. So I have an inverse Fourier transform. And this is applied to the initial distribution. And what I measure, so this is coherent. And what I measure is what? The intensity, which is equal to mod square of this. So intensity would be this. So this is coherent source. If it is incoherent, then it's different because, sorry? Yeah, so, so then I would have to look at each point here. Each point here uh, um, would be a, an independent source. So I would have, let's say, a delta of x minus x naught. That's the field being emanated from here. And to go to here, I need to do a Fourier transform of this. And where's the Fourier transform of a delta? It's a constant. And if I shift it, it's a linear phase. Then I multiply this by the pupil. Then I, um, I inverse Fourier transform this. Then I mod square this. And then I have to integrate this times my uh, u, let's say, of x0, my initial intensity squared integrate over all the x0. That is, I would have to, to add the intensities of each contribution for each point source. And if you do the math, this turns out to be just the convolution, sorry, this is not a vector here, the convolution of the intensity of the initial field with something that is the autocorrelation, or more precisely, the autocorrelation of, of the pupil, something that is uh, the Fourier transform, like the, the Fourier transform of the pupil squared. So this is the Fourier transform of the pupil would be my area disk uh, if I mod square it. And then each point is causing one of those shifted at a different location. And, and, and it gives me that. Because this is a convolution, I can write it 
as the inverse Fourier transform of what type of operation? A product. Product of the Fourier transform of the first thing, of the intensity, times the Fourier, the, the, the inverse Fourier transform or the Fourier transform of the square of the Fourier transform of the pupil. That's called the autocorrelation, and we give it a name which is called the OTF. The OTF has a nice interpretation graphically. Suppose that this is our pupil. OTF is a function of a pupil coordinate. And what it is, is if I have this pupil here, I, at point rho, I come to that point rho here, and I draw another copy of the pupil there. And it gives me this overlap area. So that function, uh, this OTF, is maximum when rho is equal to what? Zero. And it drops to uh, zero once I have the separation is twice as, twice as much as the radius of the pupil. So just to uh, stress the difference between coherent and coherent, in coherent imaging, you have to fully transform the initial field, multiply it by the pupil, inverse Fourier transform, mod square. Here you have to Fourier transform the initial intensity, multiply by this OTF, and inverse Fourier transform. And it turns out that because this, is, this drops slower than the, 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 than the pupil, um, there are, you can transmit more frequencies, more spatial frequencies in a system when you use incoherent illumination than coherent. Why? Because I have to, this row is twice the radius, and you still have contributions. Well, with coherent imaging, you, you only carry frequencies up to the radius. Of course, it drops. So this, this uh, OTF for a perfect system, if I plot it, looks something like, looks very much like a triangle, and then it drops down like this. There's a closed form formula. Of course, if we have aberrations, we have to include those aberrations in our pupil, and this gets horrible. Here. So let me illustrate this with this. this. Okay, not this one. Um, um, here. So here, uh, I'm going to make this bigger. 800. OK, so now you all know how we create these <coughs> movies. <laughs> so here what I'm doing is I'm taking our friend Joe as my object. And this is coherent imaging. So what I did to model this is I took Joe, took its Fourier transform, multiplied it by this aperture, inverse Fourier transform, mod square. That's coherent imaging. So for a big, for a big pupil like this, all of Joe's Fourier transform fits through the pupil, and I get a sharp image. Of course, if I make my pupil smaller, I'm starting to lo lose the high frequencies, and the image gets worse and worse. And it gets bad in a very wavy way. We see a lot of interference here. We see these this, this fringes here, because things go in phase, out of phase, and we have these interference effects. On the other hand, if I do incoherent imaging, what I need to do is um, take the intensity, not the amplitude of the object, Fourier transform that. Uh, so here I took Joe, not Joe, but Joe squared, and I Fourier transform that. Then I multiply that by, by this MTF, or this o OTF that looks like this. 
is this overlap between the pupils. When this is at the center is here, this is largest, is the center there where the cursor is. As we displace this in any direction, it drops to zero nicely. And then I take that Fourier transform of the mod square of Joe, multiply by this, inverse Fourier transform, and that gives me the, the, the result here. Let me make this one bigger again. And it's similar that if I make this bigger, the image is better. But the smaller it is, the image starts to get bad. But it's not wavy, it's just, it's just blurry. But it's blurry in a more, in a less, it's, it has less artifacts in a way. So, so while it's not good, uh, it's not introducing features that you don't know if they're interference features, like some things here, or if they're real features. It's, it's just a more uh, blurry uh, image. Yes. Uh, of sufficiently large pupils, no. Everything is getting through. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I am. This is a uh, an ideal world's case. In practice, your microscope, your lens is going to have little particles of dust or something, and those are going to uh, introduce some coherence interference effects that you're going to see as fringes. And those are going to be very persistent if your light is coherent, because uh, they're, they're going to uh, be very visible. If you have an incoherent source, those are going to be spread out through the image, and their effect is going to be sort of blur away. So the, the real life effects of diffraction from, the, from, from other parts of the system or from, from particles, et cetera, that, that is better in an incoherent system than in a coherent one. But other than that, in an ideal world, yeah, if, if, if all the Fourier transform of the object fits through the pupil, uh, well, strictly speaking, the coherent is better because everything's fitting through a flat pupil. So you're multiplying it by one, essentially, and it gets through. In the coherent case, you're multiplying it by something that drops. So it's really doing something. That you cannot have a big enough pupil for, a, for an incoherent system because it's always the MTF is dropping a little bit. It's best at the center and it drops a little bit. But it's, it's still pretty good. So you lose some, but you win some in that you average out any persistent coherent effects from defects in your system. Is that sort of what you were? Um, so I wanted to um, just finish by mentioning something else. So again, so for coherent, we Fourier transform, pupil, inverse Fourier transform, mod square. If I had aberrations, where should I throw them in? Sorry? Here. So I would put here aberrations. Uh, in the incoherent, I have mod square, Fourier, uh, OTF, and inverse Fourier. Where would I throw the aberrations? They're sort of hidden here in the definition of OTF because when I have this this formula, I will have to put them there. Now, the problem with modeling aberrations in this system is uh, something that we were talking about at the end of class uh, with some of you. I can only model this with aberrations for certain types of aberrations. It really has to do with your question at, uh, as well. What type of aberrations still let me model my system this way? Remember that we had aberrations that depended on rho, or rho and age, or etc. So the aberrations that depend on age mean that the system is going to behave differently for points here than for points here than for points here. That breaks the shift invariance of your system. And once there's no shift invariance, this magic formula Fourier transform 
transfer function, inverse Fourier transform, this linear shift invariant system thing no longer works. So the only aberrations that you can still model with this type of thing are the focus and spherical aberration because they don't depend on, on fields. They don't depend on, on, on where you are here. This is, they, they do the same damage here, then here, then here, then here. Because otherwise, once you do the Fourier transform, you don't have the dependence here. You, you Fourier transform that. There's no way you can put the aberration here that depends on this point. So unfortunately, uh, you can only model simply aberrations if it is spherical aberration and the focus. That's it. The, I mean, the others, uh, you have to work harder to, to model because they break this shift invariance. Um, so uh, Anna Consortini was mentioning this, uh, how did she call it, isoplanatic approximation in that the aberrations only depended on, on the pupil coordinates, not on here. That is the approximation that lets you model things easily. Once the, the, the aberrations depend on, on where you are here, then, then it's, 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 it's much harder. OK. Um, so I guess that's what I have. Uh, do you guys have any questions? We'll be happy to answer any questions or try to answer any questions. Well, if not, uh, you know where to find me, and uh, and uh, we'll have a slightly, a slightly longer coffee break. And uh, well, thank you very much. All right.